Please take your Bibles and turn with me now to Matthew chapter 16, and I begin reading with verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In Hibbing, Minnesota, about 80 miles northwest of Duluth, there is the Greyhound Bus Museum. My wife is extremely long-suffering in how I ask of her that we spend a bit of our holiday time. And about two years ago, we went to northwest, northern Minnesota, and to the area to seek out a couple of very unique experiences. One was the Greyhound Bus Museum. And strange as it may sound and seem, the great Greyhound Bus Empire, the largest in the world, began there in northern Minnesota around World War I and hence the bus museum located there. For a geek such as myself to do with buses, it was an incredible experience. I'm glad that I went, glad that my wife went along with me. I am not at all sure how much longer that bus museum will be there. When we pulled into the parking lot, there were a couple motorcycles, but the place was very much to ourselves. Of the many different things that were of interest on display, one I remember very well. At one point, there was a three-grade or three-class ticket that you could purchase. 
the first and highest price was for those who would come onto the bus and they would sit down and it didn't matter if the bus became stuck in snow, they had the privilege of staying on the bus. There was then a second grade or class of passenger and those passengers paid in such a way that should the bus become stuck in a snowdrift, that they would have to get off the bus while it was being unstuck. But they did not have to push. The third and lowest level of class or grade in the price scale were those who purchased a ticket and they had a seat on the bus, but when there was a problem, they not only had to get off the bus, but they were the ones who had to lend a shoulder and get behind and push. We are talking here about discipleship, and I am entitling this message, Discipleship Fundamentals, the very bedrock of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus laid it out for his disciples in very plain and blunt terms. I want to ask you, when you began, for those of you who are trusting in Christ, when you began to walk with Christ, to follow after him, what were you expecting? What was the level of passage on the bus, as it were, what was the level at which you signed up? Was it that you purchased a seat and said, thank God I am safe and secure, we are headed towards heaven, Jesus is the driver, he knows how to get us there, all will be well, just need to sit back and enjoy the view. Or was it something else? I won't ask you to embarrass yourself, for I think that I would embarrass myself as well if I was to tell the truth. What was the sales pitch, we might put it in different terms, what was the evangelist's or the preacher's sales pitch, or what was your friend's sales pitch for the gospel that made you, as it were, buy in? What were you expecting? As I say, we might be horribly embarrassed to say out loud what it was that we were expecting. We would be actually in very good company for the disciples themselves, those who had the privilege of walking with Jesus those three years and of having that front row experience of seeing who he was and what he could do, the gracious words that fell from his lips, to actually see it front, firsthand, to be in that front row. What a privilege. But the disciples, how they were filled with ideas of glory, how they thought that they had made it, that they had bought that ticket, and they were on the bus. Jesus was driving them safely along to glory, to honor, to great, great things. Jesus would look at them in love and he would speak to them about discipleship, what it truly was and is for us today. What it truly is for us today. Matthew chapter 16 is one of those passages that I would happily preach from just about every Sunday or every opportunity that I have, and I need to restrain myself. Great things are happening here as Jesus comes to Caesarea Philippi, perhaps for a bit of seclusion with his disciples. There was a Greek and Roman temple of very great note, 
But Jesus, he takes this opportunity for a one-on-one, -on -one, for a question and answer time with his disciples, and he asks them this question, who do the people say that I am? Jesus was asking the question, what do people out there say about me? It's difficult, Jesus would perhaps say, it's difficult for me to get close to them and to hear their innermost thoughts. Jesus, being God, already knew what was in man. He didn't need to have anyone to tell him, but he starts this discussion not so much for his own sake, but for the disciples. And so the first question that he asks is, who do the people say that I am? Not, not what do you fellows here say, what do the people out there have to say about who I am? And they give various answers about who the people said that Jesus is. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, and we could take quite a while talking about each of these and how that they had imprinted themselves upon the minds and hearts of the people. John the Baptist, that strange preacher down by the Jordan River. Elijah, the man from centuries gone by who yet lived large in the hearts and minds of the people. Prophet of fire. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Then Jesus, he changes the question very dramatically. And he says, I don't want to know what the scuttlebutt is out on the street. I don't want to know who people who really don't know me have to say about me. I don't want the rumored answer. I want to know what do you say about me? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, never one to hesitate to speak up where others are silent, Simon whether he was the one and only, he seems to be the leader again at this time. And Simon, Simon said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There is a dramatic and powerful declaration of who Jesus is. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the long-awaited anointed one. You are the one that the Jews have been looking for for centuries who would come. Sent of God. And not only are you the anointed one, for a king could be an anointed, an earthly king could be an anointed one, but Peter takes it up a huge immeasurable step we would say not only are you the anointed Christ Messiah you are the son of the living God they were standing right there in the vicinity of the Caesarea Philippi temple of the Greek Roman pantheon and here Peter he says dead gods living God you are the son of the living God. Jesus realizes instantly that Peter has got it. He has hit the very center of the bullseye. He could not have been more to the center of the center if he had tried, if he had walked right up to the target and drove his dart in there. He was in the center of the center. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you. There is a beatitude that is pronounced here, even as we have a beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and elsewhere. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood, they didn't reveal this to you. This has come from my Father who is in heaven. He is the one who has opened your heart and opened your eyes to see who I truly am, that I am greater than John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah and all of the other prophets combined. 
not just as individuals, but all combined, they are not as great as I am. And Jesus, he says to him, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon the confession which you have made and which others will follow in making that I am the Christ, I am the anointed one, I am the one who has been prophesied and longed for. I am the son of the living God. Upon this solid declaration, I will build my church. Each of those five words are vitally important. I, Jesus, is the one who is the great initiator and he is the actor. He is the workman who is doing the work. He says, I will. There is a desire. There is an intent. There is a forward movement here. He says, I will build. It is not going to be just something plain and ordinary, but he is going to raise up a grand and glorious church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And his desire is not simply to bring a people to himself, but to build them. And he says, my, he takes the church as his very own possession there is a very definite identity which is made between Christ and his bride, his church. And he says, I will build my church. Not a building, not an organization, not a denomination, but it's the word ekklesia, a compound Greek word meaning called out ones, not called out bricks not called out two by fours, not called out stones, but called out people, called out of death, called out of darkness, called out of the world in order that we might walk with Christ. Jesus says, Peter, upon this confession which you have just made, that people will come to me and I will build my church, my called out ones. And the very gates of hell, the very gates of Hades that would burn and roar and foment against the building of my church, it will not overpower it. Jesus then talks about his death. And Peter, though he had such a crystal clear, I mean a crystal clear moment of understanding of what God was doing and who Jesus was and is, he really drops the ball here. And though Jesus says, look, this is the path that my heavenly father has set out for me, Peter takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him and say, Lord, no way. God forbid. This shall never happen to you. Peter, he simply could not put together what Jesus had just commended and what is now taking place, what is now coming out of Jesus' mouth that Jesus would be taken to Jerusalem, he would go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and that Jesus would be killed. He just could not reconcile how that these things would actually take place. Jesus, as seemingly ecstatic as he was at first about Peter's words now, there is a very different response. And Jesus says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Peter missed the boat on that one. 
And Jesus then delves in to the, disciple, to the costliness of discipleship. Very, very costly. And I think that Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 28 are some of the most vital, vitally important verses in all of the gospel. We must, we absolutely must get these right in the context of what Jesus has just revealed himself to being and who he revealed himself to and how that he declared, I will build my church. Jesus is building in a strange way. There are many, if they heard this first, they would surely run. If they were already on the bus, as I described it, they would surely bang at the door and say, let me out of here. Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, if they really want to be my disciple, they must deny themselves and take up a cross, their cross, and follow. Jesus had his own cross. It was the cross of your sin and mine. That does not mean, oh great, I get off scot-free. There's nothing for me. I'm like that top grade, top class of passenger on the old Greyhound system. I just sit there and it doesn't matter what storms come along. It doesn't matter what difficulty. I just sit there. I'm good. Jesus said, if you come after me, you take up your cross and you follow. You don't just follow, you take up your cross and follow. And Jesus, he added to that, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The tighter we hold the things of this world and the more enamored we become with all of the things that are round about us, the more they entangle themselves in our heart and in our minds, the more we lose sight and lose track of heaven. Again, I come back to Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. The difficulty and the problem with the believers who received, who first of all received the letter to the Hebrews was that the things of this world were working their way into their hearts once again. They had let those things go, but they had started to feel bad about how much they had given up for Christ. And we, are, we, we read what they were told Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Christ. Don't just glance at him every once in a while. Fix your eyes on Christ and consider the beauty of his person and what he has done, the work that he finished on your behalf. Jesus would say, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits? He loses. He throws away his eternal soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that compares with the worth of a soul. Jesus would talk about the Son of Man who is going to come in his glory, the glory of his Father and with his angels and will repay every man according to to his deeds. The book, the Gospel of Hebrews, uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew, rather, speaks about heaven and earth. It talks about the solid and the shifting. It talks about us being unable to serve two masters. We'll either love the one and hate the other, or hate the one and love the other. It it talks about light and dark. It talks about up and down, right and wrong, sheep and goats. 
there is a dichotomy, there is a divide that is made. Here it is with discipleship also. Here it is with discipleship also. The Apostle Paul was writing his concluding letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, and I especially think of chapter uh, 4 and the first five verses. Let me conclude. Here, once again, Paul, as Jesus had, he is speaking very bluntly about discipleship. Some would say, well, this is just for pastors. No. This is the very tone and this is the very character that needs to permeate everyone within the body of Christ. Everyone who is a disciple of Christ. Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, send it forth, proclaim it in every way. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, but you, Timothy, here is a word that Paul is going to speak into your heart and into your life. You're not to be like them, carried away, pulled here and there, but you, but you, Timothy, and I would say, but you, church, in the trials and in the difficulties, in the struggles which are all round about us, but you be sober, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, fulfill the calling of God upon your heart. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul also said to Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me. Paul is saying, we are disciples. We are following the master together. Join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Lord, we have considered discipleship fundamentals May this work its way into every heart that we are to take up our cross and follow soberly, intently following after the master who has loved us and given his life for us. So Lord, work in each heart and life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.